Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging uh, Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Professor Joseph Lombard. You are most welcome, sir. Uh, hello, Paul. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Well, Professor Joseph Lombard is an American Muslim scholar of Islamic studies and a professor of Quranic studies at the Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar. He is the author, editor, translator of a number of scholarly books, articles on Islamic philosophy, Sufism and Quranic studies. He is also an editor of the historic and groundbreaking work, The Study Quran. Here it is, a new translation and commentary. Um, fascinating work and pretty unique, I think, groundbreaking work. Now, last week saw the publication by Joseph of an extremely significant article entitled Decolonizing Quranic Studies, which I will link to in the description below. Now, this is a, in my view, a, a devastating critique of the enduring legacy of colonialism, which continues to influence the analysis of the Quran in the Euro-American Academy. In other words, in universities in the West. Now, the article which I've read, um, here's my copy of it here, um, is an extraordinary tour de force. It opens with uh, this quotation, which I'll read to you. To control a people, you must first control what they think about themselves and how they regard their history and culture. And when your conqueror makes you ashamed of your culture and your history, he needs no prison walls and no chains to hold you. End quote. That's a quote from John Henrik Clark. So, Joseph, could you kindly explain your purpose in writing this paper? Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, that's, you know, a, uh, an excellent question. And in some ways, that purpose is really uh, summed up by the quote with which I led, which was that quote by John Henry Clark. Mm. And uh, I think that one of the problems is that many young Muslims, when they confront the discourse regarding Islam in the Euro-American Academy, they start to lose confidence in Islam. They encounter this not only in university, but in many other ways. And it also informs uh, the, the media and informs media representations of Islam. Mm. Yet, as Muslims, Muslim scholars, we haven't really given young Muslims and young Muslim scholars the tools to have what I would refer to as the epistemic confidence in their own traditions. Uh, the Quran is revered. Uh, many Muslims will even memorize the Quran, memorize sections of it, learn how to recite it well. But in terms of seeing its heuristic value, that is seeing that it has value as a text to which we can go and derive lessons which we can apply to contemporary issues, not only the Quran, but by extension, the Islamic tradition, many young Muslims now feel challenged in finding that mm -hmm. and think that, you know, in order that the most educated discourse regarding the Quran is that which is found within the Euro-American Academy. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things we have to do, one of the ways to help Muslims who find themselves in that position is to first reveal that the underlying premises of the uh, of the tradition of analysis of the Quran within the Euro-American Academy come from a liberal, secular, humanist, intellectual tradition that is in and of itself actually provincial and parochial. And we need to go at those foundations and reveal that so that it's simply one discourse over here that is happening regarding the Quran. The idea that it has uh, some value above the discourse that is occurring um, among Muslims or has occurred among Muslims is something that you will find declared 
by multiple scholars within the Euro-American Academy, but it is not something that is actually demonstrated with reference to the classical Islamic tradition. Hmm. And this is where that quote from Behnam Sadiqi that I had uh, uh, within the first few pages of it comes out, where he, he mentions that scholars have turned a mountain of texts into a molehill and declared it inconsequential. I would go even further and say that it is a mountain range. Um, and there are these multiple texts that are simply, simply declared, well, we don't actually need to use those and they are of no analytical value when it comes to assessing uh, the many dimensions of the Quranic text. So the purpose is to reveal that for young Muslims and also to get this discussion going. This is yeah. one of the reasons why I chose to put it in an open access journal would be so that many people would have access to it and it could immediately be part of, uh, of this discussion. Hmm. Okay. I mean, well, when you speak about the legacy of colonialism um, continuing to influence um, Western uh, analysis of the Quran, Islamic history and so on, well, what is this colonialism you're referring to? Because, um, you know, Britain, for example, where, where I am, we're, we're not physically we don't physically have an empire anymore we're not occupying india you know these countries thank goodness are independent countries now so what colonialism are you referring to when you use this language yeah, that's an excellent question and uh and it, it even gets into the title of the article because when i delivered this as a paper i delivered the title was decolonializing yeah. um and that's actually a more uh that's more of a proper title for it I'll get into this difference in just a minute, but I went with decolonizing because uh, that's a more familiar term to most people at present. Right. Um, so the difference between a decolonization and decolonialization ah. is that colonization really refers to this phenomena of secular colonialism, um, which are sorry, settler colonialism to which you were referring when you talk about Britain being in India and other parts of the world mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and moving into the Americas, et cetera. Um, so uh, this is a phenomenon that, in a sense, requires a physical presence. Right. Um, and it's much of what is addressed, for example, in the works of Franz Fanon. Um, but um, colonial colonialization is the phenomenon when you, when the, the, epistemologies, the ideas, the beliefs that undergirded mm. the belief that there was a right for various powers to occupy particular lands and to dictate the modes of governance in those lands, to even dictate where lines were drawn between countries and things along these lines, and even dictate their education systems. That is colonialization. And in a sense, colonialization is the way in which colonialism continues to live. And many people will say that, well, somebody like me is using um, decolonization as, quote, a, a metaphor. And there is a, a it's a just criticism and people use this as a criticism because when it comes to decolonization, the issue is give the people back their land yes. and give them self-representation and self-governance. This, however, these are tied together because you cannot effectively ensure that once a land is given back to the peoples to whom that land justifiably belongs and they are allowed to have self-governance, mm -hmm. that the underlying ideology that made a people think that they could go there in the first place has been addressed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, you can take, you can take an Advil because you've got a headache. But if that headache is due to an underlying illness, you're going to have to do something much deeper in order to make sure that that headache doesn't come back. It's interesting that we're sitting here talking about this today because Russia invading Ukraine is an exact representation of this. If you go into the writings of Vladimir Putin, he's one of the people who claimed that Ukraine was properly part of Mother Russia and sees there as being an ideological foundation to Mother Russia's claim to the Ukraine. It's until you fully addressed that particular claim, you're not going to have fully protected the Ukraine from a reinvasion from the likes of Vladimir Putin.
Okay. I, it's a slightly naive question here. I'm not part of the academy myself, so maybe that's why it's perhaps naive. But when we look at Western culture, when I look at Western culture today in Britain or France or the United States, there is a huge emphasis on multiculturalism, on diversity, on looking, uh, trying to understand the other and, and not being, um, you know, rejecting um, homogenizing narratives and so on uh, and looking to cultural uh, uh, diversity and variety, as I say. But it seems, though, that you, you're you're not impressed by that. It still seems you, you're still you seem to be saying that there is, in spite of that ideological adherence to multiculturalism, diversity, intellectual um, discussion and debate, there is still a dominant paradigm, which you call kind of secular liberal paradigm, which und- undergirds discourse scholarship about Islam and the Quran. In the Western in the Western academic context, I mean, which is not diverse. You're, you're saying it has clear uh, Western roots. It goes back to the Renaissance, presumably, and the Enlightenment and the secularization of the West. In other words, the uh, de-Christianization process, the secularization process that has been going on for centuries now. <laughs> and you're saying that, that that are you saying that 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 bedrock remains unchanged when it comes to Islam, anyway, particularly? Which bedrock? That bedrock that there must be a, a secularization process? Yes, the, 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 despite the um, the celebration of diversity, multiculturalism, and so on, the rejection of colonialism uh, and any kind of imperialistic designs on the world from the West, you seem to be saying that, nevertheless, in the academy underlying that, there is this unreconstructed secular liberal paradigm which remains unchanged, Perhaps uh, are you saying that? And, and yeah, that it does. I mean, connects with Islam. There's a, a few things that, that that we need to address there. Um, one is that you know while we can say that uh, that um, uh, the colonialism in terms of physical colonial settlism has gone and that has abated, um, nonetheless. Uh, it still exists in the ways in which you now have multinational corporate economic hegemony. Right. And so, for example, if you go into you go into uh, get your iPhone. Right. So the minerals are taken from you've literally got seven year olds uh, in some places in the Congo who are involved in the process of mining the minerals that we need for our iPhones to work. Um, And then you end up taking a lot of these parts and you ship them off to China where people are paid pennies on the hour in order to assemble them. And then they get put on a boat and then they get shipped all over the world and sold and they never actually even spend one minute in the United States of America and all of the profits get counted towards the GDP of the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, you know, so great. We've, we're not sitting there selling it, but through these various mechanisms, the pressure to conform to this international system still exists. And make no mistake about it, I, I'm sorry to go back to this, but this is part of what's happening with, with, with Putin right now, is this, this hegemony wherein the dollar system is controlling kind of everything. And we've moved towards this international corporate um, uh, uh, kind of you know, capitalist hegemony um, that we're all kind of following along and not entirely realizing what, what's happening. Now, what happens within when you're talking about multiculturalism and everything and multiculturalism, unfortunately, um, you know, I've been in these discussions within the university and uh, and behind closed doors where everybody's really happy to talk about multiculturalism. But mm. when you start talking about the fact that, well, you know, you um, you've still got other intellectual traditions as electives that aren't even going to count towards your core. Um, Then, uh, then so long as we're able to shuffle all that stuff off and say the core is going to be uh, of our, for example, philosophical studies is going to remain the Western tradition, uh, you know, seeing it as going back to the Greek tradition and then the enlightenment or the Renaissance and the enlightenment, the development of secular humanism. And this is supposed to be seen as the central philosophical tradition. And, oh, you can take an elective in Chinese philosophy. You can take an elective 
in Islamic philosophy. Um, but that's not really part of the actual core intellectual tradition of humanity. This paradigm still exists in every single Western university. Okay, they're, 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 on, on the one hand, I'll just say, on the one hand, you can't blame them. It's their own culture. Well, that, that's what I was going to say. That's what exactly what I was going to say, Joseph. That this is the yeah. thing. I mean, I, I take it what you're saying. Your critique for, as a Muslim and as a, as a, 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 a professor of the Quranic studies and so on. But this is Western culture, Western history in Western universities. So are, are we complaining that the West has been Western uh, to be, you know, uh, frivolous of a second? But but you're saying, of course, it's more than that. There is a hegemonic global outreach, yeah. uh, 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 which is going way beyond that particular local regional jurisdiction and is affecting everyone. And is that your complaint? You're not complaining that the West has been Western. You're saying its outreach is so. I wouldn't even uh, say it's my complaint. It's, it, it's my observation. And I think that there's that this is part of what post-colonial literature has done. Post-colonial theory has done is to reveal um, these, you know, this underlying uh, uh, attitude of the hegemony of uh, secular, of liberal secular humanity, and our human, so humanism. So uh, this is, you know, and that's it. So okay, you want to have the debate about whether or not that actually is the best and central um, intellectual system in the world, fine, but admit that this is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And don't try to kind of paste it over with declarations of, uh, of multiculturalism. And this will often happen, for example, when you get into uh, you know, discussions of, uh, of uh, religious pluralism and things along these lines, is that you get a whole bunch of scholars coming and talking about religious pluralism. There is imposed upon it almost an idea that we must all be conforming to a secular framework in order to have an effective dialogue of pluralism as if this is the only framework that can actually provide some form of pluralism without admitting that what we're actually then doing is setting one particular system of thought, which is actually antithetical to many of the faith traditions that are being collected here. We're setting it up as the, as kind of at the top of the hierarchy um, and assuming that the entire dialogue must take place within its bounds. Right. OK. I mean, I, I'd like to share with, with, with viewers just um, just to illustrate this point a little bit. There's a, a book here called uh, The Quran, a historical critical introduction by uh, Nikolai Sinai, who's a professor of Islamic studies at the University of Oxford. Um, and of its kind, this is a, an extraordinary book. It's just a, a published a couple of years ago in the introduction to the book. Uh, he discusses what he calls the historical critical method. Now, I'm not going to go into this in any particular depth. The reason I'm quoting it, though, is I want to just give you a taster of the implications, the assumptions, I should say, uh, the a priori, the, the embedded philosophical worldview that informs this perspective. And then we can see, I think, quite clearly how this might impact on Islamic studies. So I'm just going to read a paragraph, if I may, just for the uh, the viewers, so we can understand what the problem is, and in one of its aspects, anyway. Uh, and I say that this is a representative um, uh, spokesman, if you like, of the historical critical method in a top Western university, in Oxford University. And he says to read it. So he's telling us here what his methodology is, or what the standard historical methodology is in the West when it comes to the Quran. Yeah. To read a text historically, and this is an important point about the historical critical method, to read it historically is to require that the meanings ascribed to it to have been humanly thinkable or sayable within the text's original historical environment, as far as the latter can be retrospectively reconstructed, he writes. At least for the mainstream of historical critical scholarship, the notion of possibility underlying the words thinkable and sayable is informed by the principle of historical analogy. Now, this term historical analogy is a key term. So I'm, just, I'm emphasizing it. The assumption, what is historical analogy? The assumption that past periods of history were constrained by the same natural laws as the present age 
that the moral and intellectual abilities of human agents, in other words, us people, in the past were not radically different from ours, and that the behavior of past agents, in other words, people in the past, like that of contemporary ones, is at least partly capable by recourse to certain social and economic factors. In other words, the importance here of social and economic factors in explaining the behavior of people in the past, like the present. He continues, assuming the validity of the principle of historical analogy has significant consequences. Now, this is the kicker, I think, for me. For instance, he says, it will become hermeneutically inadmissible to credit scripture with a genuine foretelling of future events or with radically anachronistic ideas, say, with anticipating modern scientific theories. So what he's saying here is it's, in, it's inadmissible to allow scripture a genuine prophetic role okay, as a, as a God-given vehicle of prophecy. That's inadmissible according to this methodology. He then says the notion of miraculous and public divine interventions will likewise fall by the wayside. Right? Wow. So the miraculous, the supernatural, God intervening in the world, out that that is a priori it doesn't matter what actually happened allegedly you will not countenance that as a possibility the very notion is discounted he says all of these presuppositions can of course be examined and questioned on various epistemological and theological grounds well yes but they are arguably they arguably form core elements he says of the rule book of contemporary historical scholarship Extraordinary language. The rule book. There is a rule book of contemporary historical scholarship which says what you can and what you cannot do. And he's telling us what you cannot do. The present volume, he says, whose concerns are not epistemological nor theological. I bet Joseph were uh, eyebrows there, not theological. Therefore, takes them for granted. So he takes the rule book for granted in his whole analysis of the Quran. So it's set up, you know, what he's going to allow and what he's not going to allow in his analysis of the Quran. So, Joseph, I don't mean to make this ad hominem at all, on the contrary, but why is that a problem? <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Well, I, I think that what, what's there is, is that, first of all, that those that those particular and this is actually something that um, is addressed very well. There is a body of literature which um, addresses uh, the way in which the phenomena of history has been and, uh, and historical critical studies um, has actually been presented uh, as if it were uh, just this kind of uh, innocuous science that people are just simply doing it as if they were you know, doing chemistry or physics and they're just observing things and reporting what they've seen um, based upon it. And uh, I think that, uh, that this is where, you know, uh, while Halak um, has uh, addressed this in restating Orientalism, um, and uh, it's also been addressed, for example, by uh, Amy Allen in her book, uh, The End of Progress, uh, John Goody has also addressed it. There, there are multiple um, ways in which this phenomena has been addressed. But part of the underlying premise there uh, that isn't really being fully addressed is that actually history developed as the particular discipline within the university that we now know specifically to undergird the claim that the point that we have reached in Western societies is the pinnacle of human achievement. Right. And this is really, you know, coming from Kant, coming from Hegel, coming from multiple others, the university system itself was constructed with multiple disciplines that fit the new vision, the new enlightenment vision of humanity. You've right. got, you know, economics, and sociology over here to study uh, social phenomena among civilized nations. And you've got Orientalism and anthropology over here to study the development upon other, among other civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's this entire structure of it. Now, 
This is not to say that there are not things that are of benefit, even for Muslims, within the historical study of the Islamic tradition and of the Quranic text. What, what are those? Okay, so you, you, you want a more nuanced approach rather than simply a rejectionist approach to this kind of historical critical method. What, what are those aspects of that enterprise, that scholarly endeavor in the West that you see can be uh, borrowed, utilized within a different paradigm? What, what, what are those benefits oh. that are used? I mean, it's since you brought up Nikolai Sinai and 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 uh, and just so that we know, like, I mean, I uh, there are ways in which I, I like that particular book that you brought up. I think that one of the examples of that book, and I mentioned in the article, is that Nikolai Sinai is not mentioning any of the literature in classical Arabic or contemporary Arabic. He's just kind of throwing it all out in how he approaches uh, and how he approaches the text. Now, that in and of itself is not how scholarship works, all right? If we are going to claim that scholarship is to take the accumulated knowledge that has come before us regarding the phenomena that we are studying, that would, and we're studying the Quranic text, that would necessarily also include what the classical Islamic tradition and contemporary Muslim scholars have also written about the text. You know, for example, um, uh, Mustafa al-Azami, um, his book on the collection of the Quran, which is not actually even in Arabic, it's in English. And it's not even, as I recall, and I hope I'm not wrong about this, I don't think it's even referenced um, in that, uh, or even found in the bibliography of that book. So it's considered to be kind of out of the realm of what can be considered because al azami takes revelation as a reality, even though much of what he's studying isn't talking about that. And this is one of the things where you get into is the classical Islamic tradition studied history qua history, even though the scholars assumed revelation and believed that the Quran was a revealed text and that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that even though they believed all of that, they still got into some really hardcore, deep, historical, critical investigation of the text and of the manuscript tradition of the text. Now, going back to Sinai, I was going to say, he has a great two-part article on when was the consonantal skeleton of the Quranic text established. Yep. And he does a really good job with that particular article. And this is a place where the kind of the fine-tuned nature of the historical critical method, wherein it really wants to go through, okay, what, you know, what within this particular historical account can be corroborated by outside material evidence and by other texts yep. um, and by what we know about that historical period. And that's what he does in that article. And I think it's, it's an excellent article. Um, but then you could get into other places where people claim that what they're doing is historical critical method. And what they're really doing you is, what they're really doing is giving this huge speculation mm. about the origins of the text. The examples of this are the works of Wandsboro and, uh, and Hagarism of, of Cook and Crone, where this isn't, this, the work does not even rise to the level of theory because it can't actually be back-tested by other people. It's speculation. Yeah. Um, and if, if you would allow me one more, I think, for example, like this is something that is really of benefit to Muslims, is to look, for example, at the work of Angelika Neuwirth. Yes. And when Angelika Neuwirth talks about understanding the Quran as a text within late antiquity, to understand the Quran as addressing major discussions within late antiquity requires neither that we accept it theologically or that we reject it theologically. And so that is a place where it can become a neutral tool. Right. But when it's a neutral tool is when it's effective. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, now, in, in your um, article, something I found particularly interesting, with, um, when you uh, look at um, this page, page seven, and as you, as you quote Angela, has position here, um, when you look at how both the 
So let me just get the, if I could just read uh, what you say here, I think it's uh, self-explanatory. Although both the Bible and the Quran arise in the Near Eastern milieu, the history of the composition, compilation, reception, and transmission of the Bible and the Quran differs significantly, as does the nature of the classical scholarship in the respective traditions. And you're talking here, you're reasoning you're saying this, you're looking at the way a lot of Western scholarship on the Quran assumes a kind of biblical um, um, uh, backdrop. It assumes, what, well, the, the methodologies and the scholarship that works so well with the Bible and the kind of history of the literature in that unique case is then kind of applied to the, the history of the, the Quranic text and the history of Islam. And you're in quoting this paragraph, I just want to finish it off. You're saying actually they're very different. And, 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 th and this kind of parallel um, uh, approach is really unhelpful. And uh, to just finish off reading, you, you say, the Bible, and describing the uniqueness of the Bible, is a library of books by many different authors collected over centuries, and its canonical process remains only vaguely understood. In other words, how it came to be scripture over time. The earliest extant manuscripts of the Hebrew scriptures, that's the Jewish Bible, are dated to over a thousand years after the time when tradition maintained they were, when they were first composed. So in other words, the time of Moses, for example, to the earliest manuscripts we have perhaps of the, the Pentateuch. In contrast, and this is, I think, your, your point, the most recent scholarship indicates that the Quran is a single book that was compiled and canonized well within a hundred years of the time when its composition is said to have begun, which is six, uh, 610 of the Common Era. Furthermore, the most extensive scientific textual analysis of the Quran to date and people may not know this, and this is absolutely true. What just Joseph is saying is a really important point to note. The most extensive scientific textual analysis of the Quran, an analysis wherein the text is subject to rigorous uh, stylometric, stylistic, statistical computer analysis, reveals that the Quran exhibits a high degree of concurrent smoothness, indicating that, and you quote a scholar, the style backs the hypothesis, hypothesis of one author. And such findings demonstrate that while the Euro-American Quranic studies has engaged in extensive speculation regarding the origin and authorship of the Quranic text, the classical Islamic tradition in treating the Quran as a coherent text by a single author has been much closer to examining the text as it arose within its original historical context. Um, so I like the way you, you bring in that kind of historical biblical baggage that has kind of found its way over into a completely different field of the Quranic studies and has kind of, um, you know, uh, produced major problems for uh, seeing what is obvious that the Quran is a very early, complete, homogenous text and doesn't have this huge tradition history dating back centuries, which is the case with the Bible. Would you like to? Yeah, I mean, no, I think that's a very good point. I mean, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, this is and this is one of the things that has, in many ways, I think, plagued the field of uh, of Quranic studies. Mm. And this is part of what has caused some scholars to think that they can't actually go into these texts regarding the early collection of of the Quran. I mean, the, there are you know when you get into all of the traditions that talk about the fact that there were in fact companions of the prophet who had other collections of the Quran that were even in a different order before you had what is considered the Uthmanic text is the source of the Quran as we have it today. Hmm. Um, this is something that is, it's well attested in the classical Islamic tradition and that even Abdullah bin Mas'ud, who's considered one of the central Quran teachers, actually thought that the last two surahs of the Quran were a kind of more of a, a, a prayer or a talisman that people would use and not Quranic. And people would say, well, that's his opinion, but we don't, but you know, everybody has a fault. And so even though he's a great scholar, everybody has a fault. So this was all preserved. And the idea that there were different Sora orders, and we actually have lists of what those orders were in the uh, in the collection of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Um, this is really quite <coughs> amazing that you actually have all of this variance of opinion 
and the debates regarding the meaning of words and the very process of the collection of the text. Um, and you don't have anything like this really in the Christian tradition. Now let's just go, for example, or, or the Jewish tradition, go to the Christian tradition. It's into the 20th century. The Syrian Orthodox Church had a different New Testament than the rest of the of the Christian communities. And they've kind of, you know, kind of post-World War II uh, come along and said, well, you know, okay, but there's even a small group that still holds out and maintains some difference regarding some of the letters that are in there and yep. even how those gospels came to be and whether or not one can really claim apostolic succession regarding the gospels. And then the manuscript traditions themselves where in even of the canonical Gospels, there are multiple variations within those manuscripts. Uh, this is something that you really don't have within the classical Islamic tradition. And you really have far more testimony to what actually happened in some way. We could get into debates, for example, about the development of the Kira'at, that is of the canonical recitations. Um, but the fact that there were non-canonical modes of recitation is well attested throughout mm -hmm. Islamic history and that one could actually even use those non-canonical modes of recitation for analysis of the Quranic text is really a remarkable thing. So there, there were basically some scholars such as Al-Qushayri were saying that the canonical modes of recitation were limited for purposes of liturgy, you might say, for using the Quran as a worship text. Mm -hmm. But for purposes of tafsir and analysis, you could still use these non-canonical readings. And uh, so, and there are questions that come up with that. The work of, of Haytham Silki and, uh, and uh, Marishan Van Putin has recently demonstrated this, yeah. um, and, uh, and, uh, and it's excellent work. But that's where the questions are, not in yeah. how did this come to be and what was the weird way in which it was collected from all around Mesopotamia, which is just almost really a made-up fiction, within what we call the historical critical tradition. And uh, just worth perhaps emphasizing uh, for, for, uh, for all of us, for viewers and so on, that we actually have scientific empirical material evidence now for the Quran, the whole of the Quran, going back to the first century of the Islamic period, you know, within, within oh, yeah. I, of the I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's more than 95% of the entire text from manuscripts that are dated to uh, to the first century. Um, and, you know, this one of the phenomena that's hilarious that happened within the field of Quranic studies is that uh, is that many people who liked the Wandsboro thesis mm. that the Quran and in its broad outlines, which is that the Quran developed later than the period uh, that it, that uh, that tradition scribes to the collection. Um, you know, a lot of people who like that, once people actually started studying the manuscripts hmm. and doing detailed analysis and carbon dating of the many manuscripts of the Quran, I mean, you know, hundreds of them, uh, they, uh, the people changed their story. And you had a group of scholars who actually started to say, oh no, it was before <laughs> the time of Muhammad. Before uh, the time really of the crown, before the time of Muhammad. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, that it that the collect <laughs> that it was a collection process, mm. and that this process actually happened before the time that tradition ascribes, and that now the text that we have is a uh, is a representation of that collection process that we don't know about. That's entirely speculative. You don't have a single manuscript. To support it, you don't have a literary tradition uh, to support it and evidence of it. You that's something that again would have to be come from a speculative framework. But when it comes down to the to the Quran and the texts, I mean, this is one of the things that happened. Is is like okay, if you're going to claim to be engaged in a historical critical method, the mm -hmm. first thing that you do is you research the available material 
evidence because right. that's your strongest evidence from within a framework that claims neutrality. Hmm. So you're going to look at that evidence. However, the big issue that we have to deal with is that a lot of scholars for just skipped over that step. Now we're talking people sitting there writing in London and they could have traveled to various libraries and looked at the earliest manuscripts and tried to do some studies of them, didn't, and came up with very speculative theories uh, that essentially posited that the process of the collection of the Quran must have been akin to the process of the collection of the Gospels, the various Gospels, how they came together, and of settling upon which books were to be included within the New Testament. Um, and so that process was skipped. And in a lot of ways, the tradition of Quranic studies within the West is still recovering from that. Right. Interesting. Interesting. And, and just for completeness, uh, I mean, this is not a comparative religion discussion, but how many manuscripts of the New Testament or the Gospels do we have in the first century AD? By way of... I, I, I will say that I don't rightly know. Um, it's definitely, I don't think we have any, uh, but I don't know. I don't think uh, we have that any. I will I, that, that, that I was a, I, 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 it, it was a slight rhetorical question, but the answer is zero. I just, that's what I, uh, that's what I just, thought. I didn't, it's I didn't just, want to give it 100%. Uh, That's literature that I haven't studied um, in depth for, um, I'd say, about 10 years. So whatever might have come out in the last 10 years, I'm not aware of. There, there, there were some rumours, um, uh, I won't go into the story, but it was a rather sorry story, that there was a very uh, incredibly early copy or fragment of the Gospel of Mark, and this was rumoured to be the case, and it created a bit of sensation in the media. Uh, the, the scholar in America, I won't mention his name, but... Um, uh, said, I have this, but I can't uh, share it with you because I'm bound by confidentiality agreements. Uh, this is just a, a, couple, a couple of years ago. And eventually it was published and it's dated much, much later in uh, the late uh. second century. So <laughs> it, it was, um, I, I do remember. I remember you remember that? that. It, 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 caused, it caused quite a sensation, yeah. not least because and Bart Ehrman got very angry. He said, you can't hog these. You've got to release this into the scholarly community. You can't say, I have this yeah. really, really, really unprecedentedly early text but I'm not going to show you um, so you can look at it. Um, and people are thinking, that's not how you do scholarship. You've got to share it. Anyway, ultimately yeah. it did come out and it's not what it was claimed to be. Hugely embarrassing. And the scholar who did it is actually a, a very reputable textual scholar in the States, uh, I think has egg on his face, but that's why I'm not mentioning his name. But, um, but nevertheless, anyway, it's a false story, uh, fake news. There is no, there are no, in the first century, there are no texts in existence. Now, of course, they may exist in some cave, perhaps in wherever, in remote Syria or whatever, but we've not found them. Um, compare that with the wealth yeah. of uh, manuscript evidence that we now have that's been actually carbon dated, accurately scientifically dated for the Quran. And it's a very different world. Uh, and there's an abundance of. Yeah, really they are, they are very different worlds. Yeah. They're very different worlds. And therefore, they require very different methodologies yes. for analysis. And that is the point. That's one of the. Hold on one second. Of your I've got, hold on a second. I've got to let. I've got to let in a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. A cat. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, uh, okay. Do you know, you, you say that I, 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 I had a, a fantastic discussion, Professor Dale Martin of Yale University, uh, who, who appears regularly on, on the channel. And um, I think the first time I ever saw him, uh, I interviewed him, uh, there was a ring at the doorbell and it was the gas man who wanted to come in and look at his boiler or something. And I thought, well, this is so, yeah. So we went from having rarefied discussions of New Testament scholarship to uh, the gas man or something, the engineer who wants to come in. So uh, that was, that was, I kind of like that actually kind of, this is the, this is the real world, you know? Um, anyway, <laughs> yes, it is a real world. We've got a lot to deal with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, um, but, but perhaps um, looking to, to perhaps concluding then about your article, uh, decolonizing Quranic studies, so I will link to it. It's a, um, an open access uh, link. So you, you're free uh, to uh, download it and read it quite, quite properly. Um, which is great. Um, so it's one of my complaints, actually, Joseph. So, so many of these academic articles are behind paywalls, 
and they're off limits basically to ordinary mortals like me who are not going to necessarily shed out huge amounts of money. We're not, we're not, haven't got institutions who are going to pay for this. And it basically really, it, it keeps this, I mean, and that's not the intention, but you, this ivory wall, this, this scholarly um, uh, citadel, which is impregnable to the ordinary man and woman who want to read this stuff. Uh, I, I think that that's my complaint anyway about that. Yeah, it is. It is problematic. I will say, I mean, you do have to do another step, but usually when you email any scholar, they'll be happy to send you a PDF of their article now, right. which is a nice thing about the about the, the current environment uh, in, in which we live. But yeah, I mean, it, it is problematic. Um, and, uh, you know, to be frank, it even gets into a whole other dimension of the phenomena of how the Euro-American Academy controls knowledge production. Um, because now it's that you, you, you know, if the article is not within one of the, uh, one of the university press published journals that's behind a paywall, it's not considered to be, you know, one of the top A plus um, articles. Um, and then, uh, and then people will say, oh, but it was published there. Um, and, and to think along these lines, and it's a way of, of trying to limit the efficacy of knowledge production that uh, does not, um, you know, uh, ascribe to the particular hierarchy um, that, uh, that, is, that is at the core of the Euro-American Academy. Wow. The, that is the epistemic hierarchy at the core of the Academy. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's... Uh... Uh, I, I find it it's quite shocking. Well, one of the, the the purposes or aims of blogging theology is to open up that citadel a little bit and to invite scholars such as yourself to uh, talk to uh, us ordinary mortals about what's actually going on you know, what, what, in, in the area of Quranic studies or New Testament studies or whatever, um, because we're interested, actually. And many of us can read, <laughs> amazingly, and can even understand these articles. Uh, and, you know, this article of yours is uh, very readable. Um is actually quite fiery I, 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 uh, in places. I think you want, I can sense your frustration at the uh, at the way things are ha happening at the moment. But that's my, that's my last question. In a way, with this frustration, do you expect your? I mean, has your article? Is it going to be widely read? Is it going to be appreciated by the relevant stakeholders? Do you think it's going to have an impact on on this in any way? Well, the impact that you have as a scholar. Um, is not necessarily with the people who are already established within the academy. The real impact that you have as a scholar is whether or not graduate students, up and coming graduate students, are reading your work. Mm -hmm. um, that's the stuff that you're going to do that's going to change the paradigms um, that are being uh, employed within the academy. And, uh, and you say, is it going to have a wide readership? Um, I mean, right now, just before we, we were meeting, I, I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll look this up. And um, religions, I didn't realize this, they do a, a count of, uh, of how many views you've had. And it's had five times what most articles published within you know, that same range have had, wow. what the average article has. Um, and it's had, I, I don't know, something like, uh, last I looked, it was over 800 views on academia.edu. So you put those two together, it's already had 2,000 views. Um, for an academic article to get 2,000 views, um, even if it's just of the abstract in less than two weeks, that constitutes viral for an academic article. <laughs> so that's a best, uh, and, and I, so, I have, have 125,000 subscribers to my channel, and I'm gonna encourage every one of them to download and read the article as well. And I know you're going to be uh, on other channels uh, eager to interview uh, as an academic um, uh, friend of mine, uh, Professor Shoeb, who's also going to be interviewing you uh, very soon. And that will also accelerate uh, the awareness and, and readership of this. Uh, I, I actually think it's an extraordinary article. I, I was generally impressed with it. Um, and I do wish it a very wide readership uh, and impact, just to, even if it's just at the level of consciousness, awareness, of the issues, uh, even if it doesn't make structural change, even if it's just a, um, uh, as I say, a, a kind of consciousness raising exercise to the power dynamics and the inequalities uh, uh, that, that exist within the world of Quranic studies, particularly in the West and the importance of, as you put it, decolonizing, mentally decolonizing this uh, area of study. 
Thank you. That's very that's very kind of you. And that that is, you know, while I think I do think we're at a very crucial point, in fact, within the academy, um, and it's one of the reasons why I chose uh, to publish this and not just let it remain as something I'd given at a conference one time. Um, and that's where there are so many young Muslims who are coming into uh, Islamic studies in various ways, in law, in Sufi studies, in Islamic philosophy, in Quranic studies. And I think that this issue of demonstrating um, that uh, non-Eurocentric epistemologies are just as valid in the analyses of our traditions um, is something that, uh, that we can bring forward within the academy. And as I said at the end of the article, that will actually lead to a greater dialogue uh, because really, you know, this little group of people writing in European languages about the Quran is just like that little circle compared to the whole screen that you're seeing now of all the people doing work on the Quran all around the world. Wow. That, that, that's a, <laughs> and yet that tiny little circle has undue hegemony, dominance, influence uh, in terms of the... It, itself. it presents itself as having that. Right. And it doesn't necessarily have that in certain regions, but it, it presents itself. Um, it gives off this, this air as if it is the lord of, of the realm um, when really it's just another player in the field. Mm, absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, well, thank you very much. And before, before we go, do, um, can I just ask, I often ask my uh, esteemed guests, um, are, are you working on anything else? Are you book-wise in terms of intellectual production that we might look forward to one day? Uh, well, book-wise, book I do actually think that there is that, that there is the potential for this to turn into a, a broader project. Mm. Um, one of the articles that I'm, I'm working on right now is when, for example, you look at the work of Theodore Nolduke, um, who is often considered the kind of, people say, the grandfather of, uh, of uh, Quranic studies in the West. And you'll go in and you'll find people talk about, well, it's unfortunate that he accepted these dimensions of the classical Islamic tradition or, oh, that was from that time. But he still viewed the Quran within this context, which is a pers perspective that he got from the Islamic tradition. Well, what about the fact that he actually incorporates a lot of racist notions from the period in which he was writing? Uh, that's something that people aren't as concerned with. Um, whereas, and the same with Arthur Jeffrey, uh, who was writing uh, more in, uh, later in the 20th century. Um, and so these particular uh, uh, very deep racist attitudes, uh, they are not, uh, they are not confronted. And, uh, and I don't really want to have a go at Noldica in particular, but I think that the fact that people are more concerned mm. that he remains embedded in understandings of the of the Quranic history that come from the Islamic texts, then they are in the fact that he remains embedded in uh, racist views of the era in which he was writing. I, I think that that's a problem within the field, and it should be addressed. Mm, very interesting. Well, I, I I do wish you the best of Godspeed with that article and and future um, uh, book uh, production as well. Um, and just uh, thank you so uh, much uh, in, indeed, uh, Professor Joseph Lombard, for your time, your expertise, uh, your fascinating insights into chronic studies. Um, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure there'll be many people who will watch uh, your presentation uh, on this video uh, for a long time to come to get an insight into um, uh, progress that is being made, at least uh, in this area. So thank you so much, uh, sir, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. This has really been a pleasure. Till next time.